I have headphones on. Hopefully that'll cut it out. I don't know how audio works, but <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's fine. Uh, I can't really hear it, so it's all good. Um, what's Ricky short for? Uh, well, funnily enough, it's not really short for anything. I mean, my oh. my le- my legal name is Garrick, G A R R I C K, but uh, it's not short for that. My my parents, um, no, they you know. Might have said uh, you just seemed like a Ricky right out of the right out of the womb, so they just called oh. me Ricky, and it wasn't even because it could be short for Garrick. Um, that's what they told me. I'm just, I'm just like, all right, whatever. <laughs> and I, I, and I go by that because well, one, I uh, grew up being called Ricky by my family, but also because if I say Garrick, people don't pronounce it right. All right. Um, so, yeah. It's got such a good ring to it too, Ricky Beckett. It's got like it's just such a good. It yeah. rolls off the tongue. <laughs> yeah, uh, you say that and it reminds me of you know in high school. Uh, I don't know what it was. I was not a popular kid. I was a band geek, so oh, if you're in the band, you're not popular. Popular, but a lot of people knew who I was for whatever reason. And so I'd just be walking down the high, the our hallways, and I just hear Ricky Beckett, and I'm like, <laughs> hey, "Who is that?" <laughs> hey, guy. <laughs> yeah, it was it was never just Ricky. It was just Ricky Beckett. Um, I don't know, but I guess thank you. Um, that's a compliment, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a cool name. It's a good name. And thank you for being here. Uh, oh, you the bet. most holy and honorable Reverend. <laughs> uh, Father Ricky Beckett here. The on, most. Uh, yeah. The, I'm trying to put as many titles as I can in there. <laughs> the least. I think I got them all. Honorable Reverend. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Don't we yeah. all feel that way? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do you deal with that? The self-loathing. Um. I repent. Um, yeah, it's a problem I've always had. Um, yeah. It might, might have come from my teenage uh, years when I was severely depressed. Uh, so that mm. kind of the remnants of that kind of stayed. This The habit of um, self-deprecation. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you know, I repent and... Um, uh, go to the scriptures, go to the word, remembering um, what God says about who I am according to my baptism. Right. Um, and, and, I, and I go to certain of his saints, um, you know, like my, my wife, for example. Um, go to her to uplift me, my dad. Uh, you know, my dad... Um, one of the uh, words of advice he gave me before I left for the army right after high school was, um, see if I say this right. Uh, he, he said, um, anytime that you are, you find yourself being completely, you know, down on yourself, find two or three other people to encourage you and to uplift you. Hmm. Um, so I kind of, uh, done my best to do that. Um, uh, you know, first of all, obviously, obviously the word, um, but also to those, those people who care about you and love you. Yeah. Um, uh, despite the flaws you may have. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned like one way to handle that kind of like self-deprecation um, or self-loathing when you feel it is to repent. Um, Mm -hmm. and repent, like, I mean, of the things I'm sure that like you feel bad about, but also like to repent of, I won't say depression because I don't think that's right, but to repent of the like self deprecating itself. Right. Because like that, that's just like negative pride in my mind. Right. It's just, it's like all you're still only focused on you just Instead of I'm the greatest, it's I'm the worst, and either way, you're focused on yourself and not on Christ, and that's yeah, you know, that's that's how I look at it. 
Yeah, that's a good way to think of it. Yeah, uh, you know the reason why I say um, I repent is because uh, you can look at it from two angles. First, being um, as a human being, you're made in God's image. Mm -hmm. um, because you are made in His image, you are, you know, His, um, His, how do I say, His. Um, you no, know, hu human beings are kind of like the crown jewel of God's creation, right? Mm. Um, you're made in His image, and this is what separates us from the beasts, right? And yeah. that comes with a certain. Um, inherent self-worth, even though you know we have lost his image in one sense, but in the other sense, it's retained. Um, and we may or may not get to what those two senses of his image are. But anyway, so that's that's you know the one angle. The first angle is you know as Christians, um, being temples of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, you know the Holy Spirit uh, indwells within you, the third person of the Trinity uh, is in your body, right? Uh, mm -hmm. When you're baptized, uh, this is a corporeal thing. Uh, the Holy Spirit is in you. And so by just deprecating yourself all the time, um, I want to say it's... It's not blaspheming the Holy Spirit because that's the unfor unforgivable sin, right? But you are you're deprecating um, what the Holy Spirit uh, is sanctifying. Yeah. Um, uh, you are, uh, you, you know, you have been made new in Christ's image, um, and by deprecating yourself, you are, um, in a way, deprecating the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, so that's why I say repent. I or repent. even if I could get a little bit more extreme uh, with the example here, it's even in a way uh, calling God a liar. Oh yeah. By saying you know oh, I'm I'm not these things I you know I'm 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 not this redeemed loved forgiven child of God right to. To deny that is to stand opposite of the stance God has about you, yeah. which is never a, pla a, a safe place to stand, right? Never the place you want to be is opposite God on an issue. Yeah. So that's interesting. I have a lot of problems with like anxiety myself and a lot of my own self-loathing isn't necessarily depression based because I don't think I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, I mean, I don't know. I've never sat down and talked with anyone about it, but I feel okay. Um, uh -huh. I'm happy most of the time. I'm not like listless or anything, but uh, I do have this problem with my own like image or self-worth. And I imagine that people don't like me yeah. and that they're, they're against me in some way. And, and for me, a lot of dealing with this issue has been realizing that most people, contrary to what I believe, don't actually care about me one way or another, right? Like they just, I'm a non-issue on the radar of, you know, 8.999 billion people's, you know, thing here. I, I'm, you know, my mom cares about me one way or another, my wife and my father, my, my brothers, uh, but you know, like the guy at work, you know, take it or leave it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember something Luther had said, and I'm going to have to paraphrase. Um, he said, you know, when the devil tells you that you deserve death and hell, you, know, you say, yeah, so I do deserve death and hell. What of it? Now, right. I am, I am uh, of Christ. Uh, Christ has redeemed me. I belong to him. I am his own possession. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, these things that you are saying about yourself may or may not be true, but if they are, what of it? Mm. Uh, you are, I am God's own child, I gladly say it, right, that him. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm not a father yet, uh, you're a father, right? Mm -mm. No? Oh, okay. Um, no. So, I mean, though, I think just the way fathers see their children, um, 
even though they are, um, they can be jerks at times, <laughs> <laughs> children. Um, it doesn't really phase the father. He loves them anyway, and uh, you know they are his own. They belong to him. Um, anyway, uh, so that that's that quote from Luther is what's what came yeah. to mind. It's powerful to remember. Um, you had mentioned, you know, we've lost the image of God in one sense, but retain it in, a, in another. And I, I actually had to do, I'm doing my undergrad work at Liberty. Okay. And that's a lot of fun being uh, <laughs> the sole Lutheran at Liberty University. But we had to write a whole paper on the image of God because they don't believe we've lost it in any sense, in any kind of way. Yeah. Um, and so uh, because of this, paper I had to write. I ended up digging into Peeper on the issue because he writes a bit about it. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me, Peeper points out that um, we have lost the image of God, yeah. but that in the New Testament, all of the image of God references, they're by St. Paul. I think mm -hmm. he does it three or four times. But he mentions that the image of God is being recreated in mm -hmm. you once you're saved. So yeah. I think that's interesting that um, we may have lost it in one sense, but as Christians, that's being given sort of back to us, right? Being sort of yeah. re remade in us, or we're being remade, I guess, in that fashion. Yeah, and uh, that's the um, the image of Christ that I had mentioned. You know, mm -hmm. we are born in the image of Adam, uh, which you know after the fall is concupiscence. You know, sin, yeah. the inclination to rebel against God and to do evil. Um, but in baptism, uh, we receive the image of Christ, uh, which is uh, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Adam pre-fall was perfect and post-fall, obviously he was not. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I guess we should define terms. Um, uh, let's look at my notes so I don't um, mis, uh, misdefine these uh, terms. Uh, so yeah, the, the wide sense, there's, there's a wide sense and a narrow sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, the wide sense being uh, man is still a rational being. This right. is what we've retained. This is what sets us apart from the beasts. But the narrow sense is the original knowledge and or, or original righteousness of God. That's what we have lost. Um, and so when we say original sin, it's, uh, well, you say original unrighteousness, I guess. Um, you know, that, uh, by birth, uh, we do not, we're not born with this, uh, the original knowledge or the original righteousness of God. Mm. He has to reveal himself to us through his word. Um, and this is, you know, what, um, this original righteousness is what uh, we reg regain uh, gradually in baptism and which we call sanctification or baptismal regeneration um, and because uh, so original righteousness of God lost um, and then we receive that righteousness back in a well by faith in what Christ has done on the cross justification by faith right um, and and baptism um, where where Christ delivers what he has done on the cross to his people, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I, I love, uh, I love doing this. I love doing this because like we, I don't think we had like a predefined topic, did we? Were we planning no. <laughs> on no. something? We just kind of got to talking. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, and you know, that's how these things happen. Um, yeah, and just two dudes chatting. What do you, uh, is this like the most stressful week of the year for you? Um, yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, last last week was pretty hectic, and um, I've been doing all the all of our Lenten services. So, uh, I'm an associate pastor, so I have a senior pastor as well. Okay. Um, so, um, and we we alternate who does the midweek Advent and Lenten services. So I got I got Lenten this year. So I got I was doing all those, and also uh, had to preach Palm Sunday. And um, fortunately, this week I'm just preaching Good Friday. Uh, mm. The senior pastor has Monday, Thursday, and Easter. Um, uh, but I mean, I think honestly, I think last week was probably more stressful um, because I had a lot of personal stuff going on in my life on top of writing two sermons and preparing two Bible studies, um, which takes a lot of hours. Yeah. Whereas uh, this week, um, no Bible study because they're both they're both on uh, Sunday, so no Bible studies to prepare because um, just a lot going on at Easter at the church. So yeah, don't have time uh, for the Bible studies. Period. Um, so I just I just got the Good Friday sermon, but I mean I do have to look through the various. Um, uh, the order of the services that we'll be doing because they're not the normal right. divine services. Um, so just think, some poor guy out there is writing like all eighteen sermons for this week. <laughs> yeah, for uh, <laughs> like a, a soul pastor. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. God bless them. Yeah. Um, like mine, like Joe. Um, I don't think, um, I don't think all of the services we do require a uh, a, a homily. Um, I know the guy that was there before Joe and before I even became a Lutheran, he uh, did a lot of revising of the liturgy around these sorts of times of year, just because he was the only guy. And, you know, in addition to his, you know, pastoral duties and duties outside of strictly preaching, you know, meeting with people and all this, he, you know, also had a family and everything else. And I know a lot of our liturgies around these times of year, um, like Palm Sunday, there's not actually a sermon. He did the whole, like he created a whole special order of service for processing in with the congregation and doing mm -hmm. readings and getting kids involved and all this stuff. And it's really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and you go through the whole thing, but it's all just kind of like pre-written stuff. Uh, and call and response stuff with the congregation that makes it a lot easier when you're the only guy you don't have to do 15 sermons across two <laughs> weeks you know yeah so yeah um yeah lent is lent and easter are crazy uh crazy part of the year with all those sermon writings and the bible studies um yeah the for, um, it's a little bit easier on me though, just because I'm an associate, um, and not just an associate, but also a campus pastor. Um, so I have to be on campus as much as possible so I can be available for the students. Yeah. Um, cause who knows what when they're just going to drop in central Michigan university. Okay. Yeah. What's that like? Um, it's definitely very different it's not mm -hmm. like a typical uh, congregation environment um you know i i want i would say it's challenging uh just because i mean i'm on a secular campus and um right. they do um you know teach the woke agenda um but we haven't really getting, been getting a whole lot of pushback okay. um, yet, at least. I mean, there are times, like, before I got here, um, you know, they, they had uh, out on our front yard a bunch of uh, little, like, hundreds of little crosses to commemorate um, the loss of uh, the unborn through abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course... A lot of students, you know, destroyed them. Right. Um, um, 
but there hasn't been anything open and public right um about any kind of resistance do, um do kids on campus ever try and like like the atheist club or whatever try and like give you a gotcha question um does that not happen to, not to me um the, the students face that a lot more i um i don't when i'm on campus i spend most of my time at the chapel i don't spend a lot of time walking around right. um at trying to engage students because i don't have the personality for that um but uh the students some of the students for the most part do get that but fortunately uh you know a lot of a lot of the my students here um have been catechized well by their pastors mm. um and so they've already thought about these things mostly right um and i basically just build on the work that their pastors have already done with them mm -hmm. um which is a huge blessing <laughs> you know yeah. i don't have i don't have to start from scratch um uh, you know the students i have here are, are are great they do a lot of uh hard work really good work um yeah. so i'm very very blessed uh, uh and you know, all the of our of our normal students are are LCMS Lutheran. Okay. Uh, we get we get a couple who um, might be ELCA or uh, um, some other denomination, uh, but they usually don't stick around for long. <laughs> once, <laughs> once they find out what we actually teach uh, yeah. and believe and confess. Um, and but but some of them sometimes um, like like there's there's one student who grew up ELCA but he, he he doesn't come to any of our meetings or Bible studies but he comes to all of our services. Oh. Um, he just doesn't commune for obvious reasons. Right. Um, so. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think the most challenging thing might just be these just random times when. A student will walk in wanting to talk with me yeah. uh, and it's and it's usually it's all not usually but always they want to know what we believe and hmm. it always has to has to do with gender and sexuality yeah um and that's such a hard topic yeah and to so that's so when i say that's challenging it's not the only thing that's challenging about it is that they, they come um, at a time that interrupts me while I'm doing something, <laughs> <laughs> um, and which which is fine, you know that's why I'm supposed to be here a lot of the times. Um, what's not what's not challenging for me is actually confessing what we believe. Yeah, um, uh, I'm prepared for rejection. Uh, I think my dating experience has prepared me for this job <laughs> in that regard. <laughs> But I'm, I'm prepared for rejection, and I tell them uh, um, up front, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I'm going to be completely transparent. Um, I'm not going to whitewash anything. I'm just going to give it to you as it is. And, and then I just take a long gospel repro uh, approach. Um, no, I tell them what we believe um, regarding gender and sexuality. This is what the word says. You know, here's where it says it, plain and simple. And we confess this, um, and yeah, we confess and believe this. Uh, and then, on the other hand, I give them the gospel. So, yeah, we believe that these are sins, but we don't want to leave you in your sin. And we want to bring you the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Um, that, I mean, and I go into a whole spiel of why Jesus died on the cross. Um, all your sins, you know, fell on him, uh, and for for the most part, they 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 listen. Um, fortunately, uh, all the ones who come uh, asking that have uh, have come with the intent of listening <laughs> and yeah. learning, uh, and that that's shocking because uh, you now you see this all the stuff on. 
online of um, people just being extremely combative against other Christians who confess what what we believe. Um, and uh, I'm always prepared for that, but with with these just random students in particular, it hasn't hasn't happened not yet, at least. I think I think it's harder to be combative in person. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's there there's no anonymity that social media gives you, right? Right, right. Even though there's no true anonymity if you have your actual face on your profile picture, <laughs> right? And in your real name, but you know, you're Whoops. safe behind the keyboard, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, it's difficult to, there's such a connection, I think, uh, between this is who I am, and if you don't absolutely accept it and celebrate it, then you literally hate me and want me to die. And there's like such yeah. a, you know, those two things are like somehow so entwined. And it's so hard for me uh, to explain to people that, like, I don't agree with this and I think it's wrong, but I love you very much. You know, uh, I have very good friends, very, very dear to me, very close friends that are gay. And anytime the topic comes up, it's so difficult for me to explain that, like, no, I don't hate you. I think you're great. You know, I, you're one of the one of the best people I know. Mm -hmm. um, it's just this you know, this aspect of your life, I can't get down with, you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's challenging for me to see, get people to see that like, um, I can, I can not be okay with this aspect of your life, but not like actually hate you, you know, everybody yeah. wants to, if you don't completely accept me, then you hate me. And that's not true. Yeah. It's never true. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that there's any way that we can get around that, aside from just um, confessing what we believe and um, loving them. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's what I've come down to is that every time I do tell you um, or you ask and I, I tell you, I'm always going to reiterate the fact that I love you just you know just so you don't get mixed up about it um, yeah but yeah that's you were talking about how you just build on the work that other pastors do yeah. um a lot and that other times you uh you're you know telling them they come to listen and you tell them and then they go their own way um i was on a i took a road trip recently and on the road trip, uh, I was by myself, uh, so I, I just listened to the Gospel of John. It was about the same length as my car ride. And okay. there's that part, there's that part where, where Jesus is telling the disciples, he's like, just go out and reap the harvest. Somebody else has already done the hard work. Like, all you got to <laughs> do is go, you know, go reap what's been sown. Yeah. And, uh. I don't know. That's kind of what that reminded me of, you know, building on the work these other pastors have done. It's like, great. Yeah. You know, good job in confirmation. <laughs> <Help me out. laughs> yeah. yeah um, I think that really goes for any pastoral call these days. Um, mm -hmm. um, e even the ones that have vacancy, because I mean, obviously that, that those congreg congregations existed before that pastor got there. <laughs> right. Um, but so they're, even they are building on, what the pastors before them have, mm -hmm. um, you know, built, yeah. uh, well, really what the Holy spirit has built, what, what the word of Christ has built. Um, cause that's, that's the foundation. Yeah. Uh, we mustn't forget that. Uh, and then on the other hand, we have to, to try to remember to, um, to prepare for the pastor after us. Yeah. That's uh, what I was going to say. Yeah, I'm not going to be here forever. Uh, well, my senior pastor is not going to be here forever. Um, who knows if I even might become the senior of this congregation or get a call elsewhere that I might accept, not planning on it. Right. Um, I like being here. I like doing what I do here. But um, 
So yeah, um, preparing for the for the setting up the next pastor for success mm -hmm. rather than failure. Um, so how do you do that, Pastor Ricky? Uh, well, um, it's simple, but it's not easy. Uh, you know, I'm taking the college students through um, the book of Titus right now. Okay. Um, and, you know, he, he uh, throughout the whole thing, you know, uh, at least cha mostly chapters one and two, he's uh, telling Titus to teach sound doctrine. Hmm. Teach sound doctrine to, uh, uh, well, first of all, the elder, as in the pastor, needs to be of sound doctrine. Um, he needs to, you know, confess the inerrancy and infallib infallibility of the scriptures on top of all these other qualifications. Um, and if you can't do that, then you can't be a pastor. Um, and then. You know, you teach the uh, you teach the older men, and you teach the older women, and the older women teach the younger women, and the pastor teaches the young men. Um, so that and that that's how you do it. Um, simple, but not easy, <laughs> hmm. right? It's as simple as teaching sound doctrine, it, and some at the times it might not be easy. Um, whether because of pushback or the whatever times you may be living in um, yeah like you know there i mean there this is ancient rome um titus is on crete uh, just this random little island smack dab in the middle of uh mediterranean sea underneath greece um you know <laughs> the center of paganism yeah um which obviously was very difficult for them, uh, and his and Paul's exhortation was, teach sound doctrine to your people, yeah. um, and select other pastors uh, um, for these congregations. So Titus is basically bishop of right. Crete, and he was given the duty, the, the duty, the task to select pastors for these congregations in Crete, uh, who are then to teach their people sound doctrine, what we believe. Um, and that's what we do. That's that's how you, uh, I guess, leave behind uh, a, a legacy. Now, people tell me um, or ask me all the time, uh, you know, what's your goal as a pastor? And I always tell them the same thing. Preach Christ crucified, die, and be forgotten. Yeah. That's my goal. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> they look at me like I'm crazy. Um, but yeah. During during his interview with our uh, church council, they asked Joe. Uh, they said, "You what? What direction are you looking to take our church?" And he sat there for a minute and went, uh, "Up." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Up. <laughs> yeah to heaven i guess i don't know yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i tell my wife all the time that like that's the that that's like my ultimate dream is um if i could just get some nice you know small medium congregation you know 100 125 people mm -hmm. out in the middle of nowhere and uh, just die in the pulpit one day. That'd be that'd be the goal. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully I can die in the pulpit, like directly after the sermon. I can die, <laughs> and then uh, Deacon whoever can uh, just sort of stuff me behind the little barrier wall if there is one, and <laughs> just move on with the service. Like you can clean up later. I'll still be there. <laughs> clean up later. Um. Sure, I choose their own, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, um, I guess kind of on that same topic, uh, I, I, mean, I don't know if I should say this in a, on a podcast, but it's okay, um, I'll bleep it out. 
I, I, I don't like it when pastors retire, um, with a few exceptions. Yeah. A few exceptions. Um, you retire, first of all, just to be blunt, retirement is not biblical. Um, it's a completely American ideal. Mm-hmm. Uh, as part of the American dream. You know, you get your white picket fence, you work uh, till you're 65, and you retire. And I don't do whatever you want after that. Um, pastors, um, you don't, there, there's not a single instance in the scriptures of a pastor retiring from industry. Right. Right. Um, however, I will, I'm completely fine with a pastor retiring if he is physically or mentally una- uh, unable to fulfill the duties of his ministry. Right. Um, uh, whether that's I don't, some form of dementia or some you know, crazy illness. Uh, right, or cancer or something. Yeah, like cancer or anything else like that. Um, and, you know, I, I have to think of myself because I do have a disability from the Army uh, with my back and my feet. And, you know, I'm, I'm planning for retirement because of that. Um, that they, uh, it might come to a point where I am physically incapable of for, of fulfilling the pastoral office. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's good stewardship of um, of, of money and, uh, and my office to pr- to prepare for that. Um, that being said, my you no know, my intent is to. Um, you know, be a pastor for for you know the rest of rest of my life, um, and to die doing that. Yeah. Um. I would agree. I would agree. I I would say it's not biblical to hit like sixty two and a half and be like, well, I've been doing this for thirty five years, and then just hang <laughs> it up or whatever. Like that's not. Yeah. I would agree. I don't see how you could. Um, mm-hmm. I don't see how you could. I I personally don't really want to necessarily do this, um, but I'm doing it. And if I'm going to go all the way to get like a, a degree, you know, and put all this, you know, move my family and all this, then like, you know, we're doing it. You know, yeah. like you do it or you don't kind of a that yeah. kind of a thing. You have to be all in. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, and um, um, yeah, I imagine I, I'll probably tick off a few people from saying that, but you know, um, it's fine. I've done it. Yeah, it happens a lot. Um, but. I just, I don't understand. Um, I don't know. There's a lot. I think there's a lot that the in America specifically that the church needs to step back. Um. And really look at like what is um, what is American and what is Lutheran, you know, or what is American and what is Christian, because we Lutherans are better about it than any other denomination. I can tell you that I have never seen a Lutheran Mm. church with an American flag uh, up near the altar. I've not sure maybe it's out there, but like I've not seen it like a conservative uh, confessional Lutheran church, but, um, I don't know. I, in America, this, the, like the American ideals are almost more ingrained in us than Christian ideals. Um, yeah. To, to such a point, you know, I, uh, my biggest, my biggest, uh, here's, here's me getting in trouble. So you won't be alone. <laughs> my biggest thing on this is I feel like most Lutherans in America uh, say talk about like two kingdoms or whatever yeah. just so that they can make an idol out of politics just so they can spend way too much time caring about politics and give it a veneer of godliness by saying oh well God has given us civil responsibility in this realm and we have to take that seriously yeah okay we do but like you spend way more time watching Fox News than you do anything else and like that's a problem 
you know, uh, yeah. or CNN doesn't have to be Fox. It goes either way. Yeah. Um, but you go to countries, you go to countries where they have uh, like a state Lutheran church, mm-hmm. and uh, this idea that we have of like the the civil realm versus the religious realm is not one that they necessarily have. You know, right. and a lot of that is an American reading into the the idea. And I don't know, man. I just, people get too wrapped <laughs> up, I think, in being not Christian first, but something else first. You know, whether that's a Republican or a Democrat or an American or whatever. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's a problem, and I don't really know how to address it because every time I start to bring it up, people shout at me. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I think you're you're right. It's def it's in it's a first commandment issue. Um, it's idolatry, um, and uh, I forget the book we had to read at seminary, but it's for uh, it's for our worship class. Um, but the author had. The way he put it was, our hearts are idol-producing factories. Mm. Um, That's and, originally a Calvin quote. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I guess in this case, Calvin was right about something. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's very true. Uh, you know, I... Uh, you know, I, I preach... Uh, when I'm giving examples of you know, idolatry and false gods in my sermons, the, the two examples I always give are sports... Or, and idolatry, or idolatry, sports, and um, what were we just talking about? Politics. Uh, politics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you know, which you know sets them on an edge, and that's the whole point. Um, I'm trying. I'm the. I mean, it's not really me. It's the word of God that's offending you. Right. Uh, and because it offends you, repent. Yeah. Um. So yeah, there is. You know, I. I was confirmed Lutheran in 2014, and um, you know something I, I've noticed among Lutherans is we. Well, uh, I guess it's not just Lutherans. I guess it's every kind of Christian, but we like to. Um, we. How do I say it? Uh, we we. Oh man, I'm I'm losing it. We so we maybe mitigate is the word I want to use. We uh, or under we undermine the gospel um, to justify our sin, mm. um, and you know or I know Luther writes about the freedom of a Christian. Uh, we use the uh, we as. Abuse, that's the word. We abuse the gospel to uh, justify living in sin. Hmm. Um, like, you know, you know, the because the gospel has freed me, uh, you know, I can, you know, over, overindulge in these things. And, you know, that's okay. It's like, no, that's not what the freedom of the gospel means. Right. <laughs> um, and, I don't know, it's... Uh, it means it means actually just the opposite. It means that now you're free to not overindulge in sinful right. behavior, right? Right. Uh, the um, because the way I always put it is the gospel doesn't free you to sin. It, the gospel frees you from sin. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we just, want we want in America we so desperately want Jesus to be voting for our guy. Yeah. Um, and and we. I don't know. I think we fail to realize that Jesus doesn't vote. Um, (laughs) And if he were an American today, now uh, he still wouldn't vote because he's the king of kings. You know what I mean? Like, right, right. You know, (laughs) he's he's on he's on top. Yeah, Uh, I, I don't know. Somebody somebody sent me some text message from some political polling thing the other day. And they said, you know, Mr. Shepard, we'd love to talk to you about. I don't know some issue, something, and, and I texted her back and I said, "Thanks for the offer, but I don't vote because Christ is King." Uh, <laughs> and she 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 responded, "You know, thanks for your time." <laughs> but you know, I don't know. It's 
I'm not saying don't vote, you know, feel free to vote. I think voting is good. I personally, I can't even dip my toe into the water or I fall headlong. I'm, I'm big on politics. Yeah. Um, and so I just avoid it altogether now, but I don't know. We, we have this urge to think that, that the choice we're voting for is the most moral or correct. Um, you know, and right. I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. If, if we're just talking about the two polar opposites, left and right yeah democrat republican they, they each have their vices yeah um and uh you know if jesus were walking among us today uh he would say um he would call out both sides for their evils and their vices yeah well um, as he did with both the pharisees and the sadducees right exactly like, <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. uh you know, my kingdom is not of this world uh, you know, of course, that, that doesn't mean forsake your duty as a citizen. Um, but again, the first commandment issue, who is your God? Who is your king? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I despise politics. That's yeah, pretty awful. Yeah. It's pretty awful overall. Uh, but you do like video games. Oh, yeah. I love love video games. What are, you, what are you playing right now? Uh, well, at this, mo <laughs> at this moment, I'm playing Lego Harry Potter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really stupid, cheesy game. But um, I mean, what I play most of the time um, is uh, Destiny 2 and okay. uh, Elder Scrolls Online. So two games that require a lot of your time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and you no, know, those Lego games, they're, 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 they're fun and simple and just really stupid. Uh, super easy to play. <laughs> but um, I really like, um, like a fantasy, sci-fi, yeah. first-person shooter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not a big fan of, of uh, Destiny or any kind of, like, group multiplayer pve kind of a thing mm -hmm. um i i like like single player story driven uh games the best okay. like the last of us uh ghost of tsushima mass stuff effect like. yeah mass effect was good yeah that's a great game mass effect was good uh, right now i'm doing far cry 6 oh okay which is fun it's uh it's funny because these I'm waiting for the big twist at the end where you find out the bad guy is actually the good guy and you're actually the <laughs> bad guy because that's how they end every Far Cry game. So I'm just waiting yeah. to see it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I played through a couple of those. I, I've only done four. Uh, four uh, Primal. Four, four was my first one. Yeah. Uh, I played through Primal and I'm I'm on Far Cry 5 right now, the one that's in... not west virginia is it mm, montana yeah montana hope uh, county a, montana yeah um yeah they're fun i, I enjoy them i've been playing them since i was three years old um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh yep. yeah they've been a big part of my life for a long time what's your favorite game of all time uh, that's a hard question i don't know um That's really hard to answer. <laughs> um, no. Uh, One of them. All right. So I, I'm I'm, th I'm creating a in my head a list of parameters to that will be the greatest game of all time for me, and I'm judging it based on how much I've. Um, gotten into the lore of the game okay um through you know uh various methods of reading and watching uh you no know, lore so-called lore experts mm -hmm. on youtube about it and so that would probably well i would have it, it would have to be tied tied between destiny and halo okay. um because Halo, you know, they have a bunch of books and graphic novels 
um, outside the game, and I've read almost all of those. There have been some new ones that have come out in the past few years that I haven't read yet. Um, and then Destiny um, is a, a new sci-fi epic. You know, their they're, sci-fi epics are um, include, you know, Dune, Star Trek, and Star Wars, because um, yeah. the, the universe is just massive. There's so much lore going in um, behind uh, the movies. Um, and it's the same thing with, with Destiny. And uh, just, um, I don't know, uh, everything about it. Um, Halo, Halo, I would probably say Destiny over Halo just because Halo is kind of uh, fallen behind since since Bungie sold it to three yeah. three industries. Um, but but uh, Bungie is, has always been excellent at story writing since the nineties. Um, right. So that's not necessarily surprising to me that uh, and I've been playing their game since the nineties. Um, but um, yeah. Um, uh, and it. It's, it's making me think of a uh, question some people might think is, you know, pa- uh, Pastor, why do you play video games? Uh, you know, you're a pastor. <laughs> why, do, why do you spend time on Don't you things? know video games um, cause all this violence? Yeah, it's not sin and human nature that causes violence. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's, it's no, video it's, games. <laughs> yeah, it's casting the blame on something else. Uh, yeah. It reminds me of two other people who did that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I... The reason why um, it's not just video games, but it's also movies um, and TV shows, but especially those games, shows, and movies that are um, fantasy or sci-fi, mm-hmm. um, mostly fantasy because you know fantasy and science fiction too requires um, you know a great imagination. Um, and imagining these, you know, there are these these things that um, don't exist but speak to a deeper reality, yeah. In you know the real world, and I think these things can help open our eyes to, you know, the fantastical things of our faith. Mm. Um, for example, um, you know, angels and demons, right? Uh, we. Uh, I mean, aside from from the prophets, I mean, we 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 don't see angels, we don't see demons, uh, but they are very real, and uh, I think f- um, just fantasy kind of helps us to open our eyes uh, to these things. Um. And if I th- if I prepared if I prepared talking about this beforehand, I would give you some specific examples. Um, well, well, actually, I mean, Lord of the Rings. Okay. Okay. Um, obviously, fantasy. Um, Fro- uh, there's tons of tons of Christ figures in there. Um, but you think of the power of the ring. Uh, it's just a, a stupid little ring that has massive power to corrupt people, hmm. um, whether or not they're holding it. I mean, look at Sauron, he was a white wizard, you know, this angelic being, and his desire for the ring corrupted yeah, him. Yeah, just thinking um, about it. Yeah, and of course, uh, I know Tolkien would say he didn't intend it this way, uh, but that's how Christ figures and stuff like this work out you don't always intend for it to happen but it happens um which i think is inevitable as post-resurrection people it's bound to happen anyway um and and, you know the ring is i think is representative of sin right um sin corrupts and everybody i'm even somebody as so-called pure and virtuous as um I think I said Sauron earlier. I meant to say uh, Saruman. Saruman. Yeah. yeah. Um, Saruman. Um, even someone as virtuous as him was corrupted uh, uh, by the just the simple desire for the ring. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly what sin does and what the desire for sin does. It corrupts uh, even the most so-called virtuous of people. You know, our, our righteousness is as filthy rags, as mm. Isaiah says. And so something like that, this is a fantasy world, something like that can open our eyes to something like sin. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Gandalf... Um, uh, especially as Gandalf the White, an angelic being, walking amongst the people of, of Middle Earth, that's Jesus. Jesus walked amongst the people of Earth, um, and, and just as you know, uh, Gandalf helped uh, the people of Middle Earth dispel the evil works of Morgoth, um, the, the the Satan figure, even more than Sauron. Uh, is similar to what Jesus did when he walked uh, on the earth among yeah. us, uh, dispelling the evil work works of Satan, and of course, ultimately on the cross. Um, but you don't get that cross thing with Gandalf, of course. But, no, I, I think that's probably more Frodo carrying yeah. oh, the ring. Yes, right. Yes. This is Frodo bearing the sin of the world, so to speak. Yeah, carrying the ring, throwing it into the fire, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and I, and I was going to get to that. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, no, no, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, yeah, so Frodo bringing, bringing the ring to Mount Doom uh, visualizes uh, for us what Christ did. Mm -hmm. um, Christ brought our sins like to Mount Calvary and destroyed it. Destroyed your sins and my sins on the cross destroyed its power and its dominion over us, as Paul would write in Romans 6. Hmm. Um, and just as you know, Frodo carried the weight, the burden of the ring to Mount Doom, where it was destroyed. Um, uh, and then, of course, the, uh, I think the greatest Christ figure is actually Aragorn, the promised king. Hmm. Right? Just who The promised king who would uh, inaugurate peace on Middle-earth just as Messiah, the, the Messiah being the promised king to inaugurate his messianic age of peace in heaven and on earth. Um, so it's just a long way of saying these fantasy worlds we create help visualize the greater reality of, um, of, of God yeah. um, and of his, and in some cases of his kingdom. Um, so that's why, uh, and a, a much short why I play video games. That's why, uh, and a much shorter reason why is because they're fun. Okay. Yeah, right, <laughs> they're fun. Yeah. Um, why do you watch sports? Because they're fun. It's fun to watch it. Why do you, I don't know, make something in the garage? Because you enjoy it. It's fun. Um, right. To each their to each their own. Um, yes. Well, Pastor Ricky, thank you, man. Thanks you for, for sitting down and having a, like a really chill conversation with me. You betcha. Uh, anything I can do for you? Any anything you want to free to feel free to plug? Uh, sh yeah, sure. Um, so I, I just started this uh, little silly podcast. Uh, devotion and cafecito. Um, it's really it's for it's. Uh, I made it for my parishioners. Um, somebody had uh, and the college students. Uh, somebody had wanted um, me to do daily devotions mm -hmm. um, on our Facebook page, and that started out with me writing something uh, every day, and that became too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I started doing these. Started doing uh, these TikTok videos, um, and the longest I, I can do is three minutes, um, and I found that not even that is enough. Hmm. So now um, I'm just doing it on Podbean. Okay. Um, so it's um, so devotion and cafecito. Cafecito is C A F E C I T O. Devotion and cafecito. Podbean. Com um, basically what I'm doing on that right now is just literally just walk, uh, and I, I, the way I say it is walking through the Bible, 
walking through the Bible with Jesus, just going from Genesis to Revelation, cool. not talking about like every single little thing. It's just um, my own personal reading through the scriptures and just talking about things that jump out to me. Okay. Um, so that's what it's starting out as, and some topical things will arise here and there that I may talk, may or may not talk about. Um, and my plan after that is to walk through the confessions. Nice. Um, which won't be until a long time for now because the Bible is huge. <laughs> the Bible is huge. And um, the confessions are also huge. So Yes, they are. Years so, of content. Yes, exactly. That, and that's the intent. So I got something for quite some time. That's cool. Um, and I think the, the uh, only other thing would be um, my blog, um, which I've been running for some time. Uh, Maddie, uh, Madeline Rose Craig writes for it. Um, the Lutheran Column dot com. Um, cool. Yeah. Uh, and our whole phrase is write boldly. You know, like sin boldly, but write right. boldly. You know? Write boldly. Yeah. Write That's boldly. That's good. So. Awesome. Well, I'll yeah. link all that. Um, Pastor Ricky, thank you, man. Yeah, thank you for having me.